thankful that you can see me even though it's <laughs> How many of you can hear me? Oh, yeah. I know you can hear me. Just recently, I thought about this, Tommy Glenn. Uh, we were at Man Church, and Bill Britt preached a message. And in his message, he talked about how churches will dismiss when electricity goes out. <laughs> and I said, hmm, I can remember a time uh, when I was serving at one of the churches on a Sunday night. We were about 10 minutes into the service. Electricity went out. No one panicked, but people started getting candles and putting them out over the building. And then we were able to worship the Lord in the candlelight. After the service was over, the people that were there that night said that they will always remember that service. We were there to worship the Lord, and we're thankful for the opportunity that he's given us this morning to be able to worship him. And so let's go to him in prayer right now. Lord Jesus, it's a privilege to worship you. No matter if we have electricity or not, we thank you for the opportunities that you provide in our life to be able to worship you. And Lord, I think that you are challenging us to see how much we truly love you and how much we are devoted to serving you. Circumstances change all the time, but we thank you that you are God that never changes. You provide everything that we need. Lord, we thank you that you are sufficient. We thank you that you are awesome. And even this morning, as we have gathered together in this place, your word says, for two or more gathered together in your name, that you will be in the midst of us. So we thank you, Jesus, that you will move and work in a mighty way this morning. As we have come into this place, worship you. We thank you for the Holy Spirit and how he draws us to you, Lord Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated here. Now let me just say this. We had an awesome day here at First Baptist Church yesterday. Those of you that shared your testimony, those of you that volunteered to help, we just had an awesome day. And uh, let's just give those that help Yesterday, a round of applause. Okay? We had some guys here that one of their sons was playing, and he said to me that he couldn't believe how nice the facility was here. And uh, they took a tour and just looked at things over there on the Family Life Center side. And so they were thankful to First Baptist Church. I tell you this all the time, but they're thankful to First Baptist Church for providing this for our community. It's a great opportunity. For us to come together to serve the Lord through sports and allow us to be able to allow people to be able to get into the uh, buildings here to hear about Jesus Christ. And ultimately, we want to see those that don't know Jesus to know Jesus and those that do know Jesus to be discipled and become more like Jesus. That's right. So let me ask you this morning. I can see all of you, just like the electricity was on. <laughs> Are you ready to worship the Lord? Amen. 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 All right, Tyler, let's worship the Lord.
say on many occasions, especially at funeral services, because we've known Jesus heart to heart, we will see him face to face. And I'm looking forward to seeing my Lord and Savior Jesus face to face because I've known him heart to heart. And as a spiritual leader, I know how important it is to lead people to Christ and to teach them how important it is to serve Jesus, even though we don't have electricity. We can still serve the Lord and worship Him. And there should be no excuses that people give for not following the Lord and serving after Him. Now, please don't do this, okay? Don't scold those that aren't here this morning. But encourage them to come and worship the Lord and to serve Him every opportunity that they have. Encourage them in Christian love. That's what I do. On this day, September 24th, 1965, one of the world leaders passed away. He predicted that he would die the same day that his father died. This leader, if it were not for his strong stance against Nazism, America may would be speaking German now. If Americans would not have taken up the battle, after December the 7th, 1941, we would be a whole lot different than where we are today. But on this day, 56 years ago, Winston Churchill died. And when they got ready to show his funeral service, they said more people in America watched the funeral service of Winston Churchill than they did President John F. Kennedy. Most of the people that were alive during that time realized if it wasn't for the leadership of Winston Churchill, when the Nazis were bombing London night after night, and he would go out there and look at the, the dead bodies and say, hey, we must continue on. We will not give up. We will fight with blood, sweat, and tears until the very end. We will not surrender. My friends, I think that is a word for the New Testament church today. We will not surrender. We will not give up, no matter what we face in life. And I want us to turn today to Joshua chapter 1. As we talk about this subject, listen to this very carefully. God blesses our obedience. God blesses our obedience. <coughs> now, as you turn to Joshua chapter 1, and as you hear this message today, you may be tempted to think, well, the preacher knew this was going to happen today. <laughs> I didn't know that it was going to happen today, but in God's providence and preparation and in studying, I was ready to preach Sunday morning. And as you listen to the words of God, may the Holy Spirit speak true. And I want you to stand as we read from Joshua chapter 1. Beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, let me just stop there, several times throughout the scriptures you see Moses identified as the servant of the Lord. It came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all his people, to the land which I have given to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you. As I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea to where the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man, underscore that, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall 
Genesis. One is the land and the other is the blessing. God has a place. God has a territory that he wants his people to have. And when God says you will have it, I promise you, you will have it one day. That's right. Look at Israel today. And see if they do not own that land. They are responsible for the land that God promised to Abraham. As you study your Bible, you will see all throughout history, even going forward, that Jerusalem one day will be the place where Jesus Christ himself reigns. He knows the place. He knows the territory. And God promised Joshua, you will lead these people to the land of promise. And when God says, you will conquer this land, no matter what you face, you can rest assured that you will conquer the land. Moses would be known as a prophet, but Joshua would be known as the conqueror. God was preparing Joshua in those moments where he was assisting Moses to be able to do battle against the enemies of God. Maybe as a little child, you... You sang the song, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. And let me tell you, when you think about the walls that were tumbling down at Jericho, Roger, they had that Jericho march. And the people were told, don't you speak. Don't you say a word. You know why I believe in, in some instances that God told them not to speak? Can you just imagine people having to march around a wall? What they would be thinking in their mind? Has Joshua lost his mind? Can you imagine the, the conversations that would be going on among the people if they were allowed to speak? This is crazy. What are we going to do? Walk around this wall and, and then it's supposed to come tumbling down. This is absurd. God knows people very well. And so in their silence, God was working and he was preparing their hearts to see a miracle, something amazing that only God could do. And you know the story well. That wall came tumbling down. Who allowed the wall to come tumbling down? God himself. But he had set aside Joshua as this leader. So secondly, I want you to understand God provides the leader. He provides the leader. Who said that Joshua would be the next leader? Did they get together a committee and say, hey, who's going to be our next leader? No. Cody, they didn't have a committee. They didn't have a vote on it to say who's going to be the next leader. God said, Joshua is the man. Joshua is the man. He will follow in the footsteps of Moses, he's my man. And let me tell you this. When God says he's got a man, we better make sure that we acknowledge who that man is. We better make sure that we understand that, that God has a purpose by using that individual. Now listen to this. God gives some reassurance here to Joshua in verse 5. He says, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Can you just imagine Joshua observing and watching Moses and what he was having to do in that moment? And just to give you an idea of this, there was at least two million people that were being led out of Egypt into the promised land. To just wrap your minds around this number, Houston, Texas has about 2 million people that live in the city limits. So I want you to just imagine having to lead at least 2 million people out of Egypt into the promised land. It seems like a, a lofty task, doesn't it? It absolutely was. But as Joshua was observing this, he was involved in this, there may have been some insecurities in his own life saying, hey, I don't compare to Moses. <clears throat> Look at what Moses was able to do. But God gave the same promise to Joshua as he did to Moses saying, I will never leave you or forsake you. Joshua, you are my man. And he says here, no matter what man, 
shall rise up against you, they will not be able to stand against you all the days of your life. And as you study the, the wilderness experience, you realize that every five minutes, scholars tell us someone was dying in the wilderness. They were having a funeral service every five minutes as it was death after death after death. And why were they dying in the wilderness? Listen to this important truth. Because of their disobedience. Because of their disobedience. You see, in all likelihood, they could have been to the promised land in around two to three weeks. Some people say maybe even less than that. But God put them in this wilderness experience because he was testing their obedience. I'll tell you this, you write it down and I'll sign it for you. You don't know what someone will do until you put them in the circumstances. Can you say amen to that? Amen. You don't know what someone will do on a Sunday morning without any electricity unless the lights are on. You don't know. You can ask them leading up to this time, what would you do? Oh, and they would regularly tell you what they would do. But then provide the circumstances, the situation, and see what they will do. You see, God tests our obedience. And here, Moses is dead. And so there's a point of application that we need to know. God is going to allow Joshua to conquer God's enemies. God's enemies. He's going to use the people of Israel to conquer the enemies of God. And there's an important truth here about Joshua even back to Moses. Follow those who follow God. That's right. Let me say that again. Follow those who follow God. Now there will be friends that will tell you that they're following after God. But you observe them. You watch them. You see what they do in certain circumstances to see if they follow God. Now, I want you to know something about Moses and Joshua. They were not perfect leaders. Moses committed murder. Moses had a problem with anger. And those that are critical of his leadership, God ultimately dealt with them. Now, Joshua was not a perfect person either. I'm sure he had his, his flaws and we know that no one is perfect other than Jesus Christ himself. So when we think about this, we understand that God is going to conquer his enemies. And then listen to this. Thirdly, God provides the precepts. The precepts. Listen to what he says here in verse 6. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide an inheritance for which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do all according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. Most of you know that I'm, I'm coaching basketball for, for Ray and McKinley. Now, one of the things that I get them to do because especially the boys they like to shoot three-pointers. Man, they get out there as far as they can and they'll shoot those three-pointers and shoot those three-pointers. So what I do in our first practice is I get them ferry to shoot underneath the goal and I say, how many did you make out of seven? There were seven on the team. They may make three out of seven, four out of seven. And I said, okay, how many did we make? And they'll tell me how many they made. And then I say, okay, y'all want to three, shoot three-pointers? Oh, yeah, let's shoot three-pointers. They're so excited. There's so much enthusiasm. I said, you go to the top of the three-point line here, and you shoot it. Out of seven chances, it's usually, I'm not trying to belittle them, but it's usually zero out of seven. Zero out of seven. Maybe if they make one, that's, that's pretty good. And so I tell them, if you want to be successful, you get closer to the goal and you have a better opportunity to score and make more points. But even though, Tyler, I say, don't shoot three-pointers unless it's at the end of the game. I noticed with some of those players, just because I said, don't do it, what do they want to do? They want to shoot it. And most of the time, it's an air ball or it's a brick, and it's really bad. But every now and then they'll make one. They say, Coach, look, see, I made one. I said, one out of a hundred is pretty good, isn't it? 
says, they want to do the opposite of it. They want to see if they can get people to follow them instead of to follow God and the leader. You know what I've learned about those people? Listen carefully. Stay away from them. I don't care if you've known them for 30 or 40 years. They will lead you astray. But follow God and listen to his precepts because listen to this. Three times God said to Joshua, be strong and courageous. He says, observe and do all according to the law. You don't want to know what the key to success in life is? Oh, it's worth coming this morning. You know what it is? Be obedient to God's law. Do what he says to do. And you will be successful in life. Now, success isn't always about winning. The other night I had a pastor friend and I called all the guys over there and I said, hey, look. I said, one of the most important things of being successful playing basketball is listening. Listening. I said, if you don't listen, you'll have a better opportunity for success. One of the little boys spoke up and he says, if we listen, we'll win all of our games. I said, no, no, no. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying you'll win all your games. But I'm saying you'll have a better opportunity for success. If you listen, if you're teachable, if you're coachable, you will have a better opportunity for success. God tells Joshua here. He says, listen to verse 7. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. And then listen to this. Verse 8, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Yesterday after our, our ball games, we won both of our games. And I was so encouraged. I, I knew one team was going to do really well just based upon that first practice. But the, the second team I had, I wasn't so sure after that first practice. But then yesterday, when they were in the game, they performed and they did well. And I got home and I was talking to Melanie about it. And, man, I was so encouraged. I said, man, they listened. They did what I told them to do. And then they were successful and they were so excited. They had a good time. And then Melody reminded me, she said, you realize after about three or four weeks every year, whether it's football or basketball, about week three or four, they don't listen to you as well. <laughs> oh, I said, bless your heart. <laughs> bless your heart. You had to remind me of that in my moment of encouragement and optimism. But you know what? She's right. You would think after being successful and being able to achieve certain things in life that people would continue to be obedient. But then we look at the nation of Israel in the wilderness experience. At, at times it looked like they were getting it together, but then rebellion, disobedience, not following God's leader led to many destructive things that they experience. And so I want you to know this. When we observe all that is in God's word, Joshua was given what we call the, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible that were given by Moses. And, and he was chosen to observe it, literally to, to apply it in the study of day and night. Do not turn from the right or to the left hand. <coughs> Then you will be able to conquer your fears. Conquer your fears. Three times. Be strong and courageous. Do you think people are fearful today? Now, let's think about this. Let's, let's just try to analyze this in this moment. Some 
people have been fearful of the virus. So they say, well, I'm not going to get around people. I have uh, some type of uh, health issues, so I, I am a little concerned about that. And, and we try to help them and try to encourage them to be cautious, be cautious, be careful, but don't live in fear. Trust God. Some people, even today, just to, just to press this a little bit, it's not the virus. It's there's no electricity at church. Hmm, I don't know, but I can still see you. You can see me. Uh, none of you were put in any jeopardy as far as I know of. And yet, people probably heard faster than they heard anything else. There's no electricity at First Baptist Church. I wonder if it spread faster than the gospel spreads. Mm -hmm. I wonder if people were passing on the word. There's no electricity at the church. But they don't spread the gospel and tell people that Jesus is the way of salvation. Jesus, who died on the cross, who resurrected the third day, you can have a personal relationship with him and let that word pass from house to house and place to place. Joshua was given these set of circumstances. And in Psalm chapter 1, verse 3, turn if you would there real quickly. Psalm chapter 1, verse 3, the Bible gives us some, some indications as to how we can be blessed by God. And the psalmist says this. Let me just look at verse 2 there. The Bible says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates how long? Day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters, or water, that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does, he shall be what? Prosperous. Prosper. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, and if you meditate on it day and night, you will be successful. And so listen to me. It doesn't say just to read the law. It says to meditate on the law. Study it day and night. Joshua had that responsibility of studying it. I would encourage you as a Christian, when you're studying your Bible, to have a pen handy, a notebook handy, and study it. Some people read five minutes of the Bible each day and hey, they check it off the list. But when it comes to the personal application in their life, that it's not sufficient. They believe they can live however they want to live with no consequences. But because of this responsibility, Joshua knew that you are to meditate and observe to do all according that is written in it. The precepts, the instructions. Now I want you to know, church, that we believe all of God's word is inspired by God. We believe it from cover to cover. We believe the maps are inspired, right? All of it is. And when we allow God's truth in our life, we observe to do all according that is written in it. We will be prosperous. Now, the question is, have I not commanded you? What's the command? Three times. Be strong and courageous. Don't we need to hear that message today, Roger? Right. Be strong and courageous. Don't be a coward. Don't be a wimp. Serve Jesus Christ. He's coming for his church. He's coming for you and me. If we have a personal relationship with him, we need to be ready to meet him. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Wherever you go. Whether it's to Shadow, Louisiana, or it's to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, or it's to Washington, D.C., or it's to Israel, wherever you go, God will be with you. He will protect you. He will provide for you. He will prosper you because God is with you. Wherever you go. But we're obedient to where God sends us. God gives each one of us an assignment. What's your assignment today? What's your assignment? It's to obey God. It's to trust Him. Go here, go there, be obedient to Him. He has given us the assignment to love Him and to love others. When we love Him, we will love others. Don't believe this concept that comes from people that say, Oh, I love people. But then they do things to be. When you love God, you will love others, and it will be the testimony of your life. Now, I can assure you that when 
were having to deal with disobedience and rebellion and the things that people were doing. They said, oh, he doesn't love us. Oh, yes, he does. When you love your children enough to correct them and discipline them, you know your Bible. You know that's what's best for them. And you want them to be instructed in the ways of the Lord. You want them to learn that correction is good for them, not bad for them. Just watch what the Bible says when you correct a scoffer. Someone that shows up and shakes her head and says, I don't want to do that. I don't want to listen to that. I'm not going to do that. That's a scoffer. And the Bible says that the scoffers in the last day will become more prevalent and prevalent. And just as they were in the days of Noah, we will still see them today. What's Noah doing? Building an ark. He says, God's going to destroy all of us with water. He's lost his mind. He's crazy. And yet only Noah and his family were spared. When God shut the door, no one else was getting in. And can you imagine people say, well, that's not a loving God. Yes, God loves, but he will deal with those that are disobedient and rebel against him. They had every opportunity, yet they chose not to be saved. So use your spiritual gifts. Real quickly this morning, I want you to think about this. Our next generation of leaders. Yesterday, I was observing here at First Baptist Church, the next generation of leaders. We have younger people serving and ministering, and it, it warmed my heart when they were sharing their testimonies about what Jesus Christ had done in their life. It warmed my heart to see them serving people and serving our community and ministering to people. Next generation of leaders. Joshua was in the waiting to be the next leader for Israel. <laughs> Moses had died. And I want you to know that death is what God brings to us in his divine timing and his divine purpose. And death could be a blessing from God. God wasn't in heaven wondering, what am I going to do? My, my servant is going to die. What am I going to do next? Joshua was in waiting. He was ready for his moment. And God would use him mightily. We call it passing the baton or, or passing the torch today. And I want you to know when the next generation of leadership steps up, listen to me carefully. Be graceful towards them, not resentful towards them. Be graceful, not resentful. Don't criticize, don't complain, don't, don't try to rain on their parade as they're trying to do things that you said, we didn't do it that way. Well, let me just ask you this. You remember the good old days? Some of you remember the good old days, right? When there was, there was no electricity. There was outhouses. The good old days, right? Where you had to walk to school up the hill twice. Remember those good old days? We have a tendency to remember things better than what they actually were. But the truth is, when the next generation of, of leadership steps up, don't be resentful. Be graceful. Trust, but verify, encourage, don't discourage. So today I'm going to leave you with this, and then we'll be finished. We have to be immersed in God's Word. That's what God's telling Joshua. Immerse yourself in God's Word. This is the leadership God. Sammy, I went into a, a rather large church one time, and and I call on leadership with their staff and with their, their leaders there. And I used the book by Henry Blackaby on God's chosen prophet dealing with the life of Moses. And I told him, in order to be the leader that God has called you to be, you must meditate on the word of God. This is our instruction manual. Not what people tell you, but what God has said in his word. And I want you to know in Numbers chapter 13, verse 16, the Bible says that Moses is the one that named 
Joshua. Gave him a new name. But Joshua has the idea, the name itself, of salvation. Salvation. Deliverance. The name Joshua, you ready for this? The name Joshua in the Old Testament is equivalent to Jesus in the New Testament. Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, the Redeemer, he is the one that protects Israel. He is the one that protects us as his children. He is the one that provides everything that we need. Jesus. Jesus alone. God was telling Joshua, I will stand with you. I will stand for you. And Joshua, as Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against you will prosper. Joshua, I got your back. I don't care who rebels against you. These enemies that I have, you will defeat every one of them. And I'll get the credit for it. You see, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 8, verses 19 through 20, that we are to go and make disciples of all the nations, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And Jesus says, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. How many of you this morning realize that Jesus is with us? He's with us. In Hebrews chapter 13, he says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He is with us. So focus on God. Meditation. Because there's nothing more valuable. And listen to this. Study God's word. Don't just read it. You ever met anyone? They, they can tell you where certain things are in the Bible. They will quote certain scriptures, and yet you look at the application, how they apply it to their lives, how they apply it. This morning, if we meditate on God's word and, and we live it out, we live it out as we wait on God, we focus on God, and it must be done out loud. When you meditate on something, you speak it out. How many of you speak out God's truth? You say, I know what God's Word says. This past week, Julie gave a devotional thought that goes along these lines, and I try to get the, the kids to be able to, to memorize this because I think it's very important as it relates to what we're talking about today. In Proverbs chapter 6, verse 3, this is how I told them to be able to memorize it. When do you get to drive? Most of the time it's 16 when you get your license. I said, three. What does three have in common with everyone? They said, I don't know. I said, that's probably the first time you get your first biscuit. <laughs> so Proverbs 16, 3, the Bible says this. Listen to these words. Commit your works to the Lord, and your thoughts will be established. God will give you success. Psalm 37, 25 has that same idea. Trust in God. He will give you what you need, and you will be successful. You will be able to see wonderful things happen in your life. But only through obedience. Obedience. This past Wednesday night, I asked those that were here on Wednesday night, what's important to me as a pastor? I remember Roger over there said, for us to be obedient to what God tells us to do. He's right on. Because when we're obedient to what God tells us to do, He blesses us, He uses us. Now, some of you say, Man, that's wonderful. He's going to bless me with all kinds of finances and, and resources. And hey, I want that. No, that's not what He's talking about. He's talking about He will work in our lives, He will direct our paths. Because we trust you. How did you end up where you are today? I hope you can say the Lord led you here. He put you in a place. He's provided a person in your life to lead you. He's put precepts in your life. Instruction. 
be able to serve him. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, you may be in this building today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. He is the way of salvation. He said he would never leave us or forsake us. He's always with us if we know him. If you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus, you can today. By admitting to him that you're a sinner, by putting your trust in him, that means to put your weight on him, realizing that without him, you're absolutely nothing. Confess your sins. The Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins. And when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your life changes. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. We hope all things become new. You're a new creation. Right where you're sitting this morning, you can ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. To save you. Because you know him heart to heart and you see him face to face. For others of you today, you can say, preacher, I'll have to be honest with you. There's been times in my life where I haven't been obedient. We've all been there. But we learn from those sinful decisions. And we say, Lord, help me to never do that again. And we say, Jesus, from this day forward, I'm going to serve you. If that's you in just a moment here, come and let me know that you Decided from this day forward, you're going to serve Jesus, no looking back. You're going to trust Him in all things. Maybe you want to be a member here at First Baptist Church. It's a great place to serve. It's a great place to minister. There's no perfect churches. But we serve a perfect Savior, and His name is Jesus. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for this service that many of us will remember for years to come. Thank you that you are here with us, that you are moving, you are working. So during this time of invitation, help us to be obedient as we sense you leading us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to stand. Melody plays. I'm going to be right here in the front. If you want to come and pray at the front, they're going to be praying for you. Let the Spirit lead us now. You come. special service today. Lord willing, we'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock.